Grimes' activity, though, it's so stark as Toppin gets the dunk. His jump shot relentlessly yelling at him to shoot even during his slump, and Dorian jokingly said... Tom Thibodeau loves this aggressiveness, attacking the paint, breaking down the defense, and then you cannot leave. It's been that kind of start for Brooklyn. Cam Reddish steps into a three. That's good. What's up, Knicks fans? Sports performance and movement coach Ray Brenkert back again for the Knicks wall, this time to talk to you about something a little different. With the All-Star break and trade deadline in the rear view, I thought it would be a great opportunity to reflect on the season and look back at what's happened with the topics of our previous videos with Obi, RJ, Mitch, and Cam. It gives me a chance to also deliver some mostly good news after what was a slog of horrific losses, but more importantly, it does give me a chance to talk about how right I've been. Crookney makes his move. Alley up to top him! The corner. Committed by the box. Quickly, alley oop! Toppin! Obi Toppin. Obi Toppin's improvement from last season was actually the inspiration behind these videos. When he came into the league, his center of gravity was an issue. Here's how I described it this fall. But Obi Toppin's center of gravity has been a issue for him. We can see that he plays very, very over himself and over his feet, his forehead is a little bit over his toes, which did not allow him to move side to side very well. It didn't allow him to twist very well. It didn't allow him to keep his man in front of him very well. I was left to reason that a large part of Obi's off-season workouts were to develop and improve his mobility and range of motion in his joints, his hips in particular. Now this work allowed for him to lower that center of gravity, which in turn made him much more fluid and dynamic. It's not all explosiveness anymore. He even looks like he's gliding to the rim on some of his drives. Now, look at today, Obi Toppin's center of gravity has improved so much through his hard work that he's now, instead of playing 6'9", he's playing somewhere around 6'4", in a natural squat, which allows him that ability to move side to side quickly, move lateral back and forth a lot quicker than what he was able to do. And that's all because he's playing a little bit lower and really honing in on that center of gravity. We also discussed Obi's landings, showing how this year he keeps himself in way better alignment, like right here during his dunk contest win. Feet, knees, hips, all in alignment, and it's not at all abrupt. See how he keeps going to better distribute the force of his landing? It's emblematic of his play all year. The only time he's missed was due to health and safety protocols. And by the way, there is no way Obi pulls off any of these dunks without having unlocked his hips. However, while Obi's able to get in that lower stance and move better laterally, from time to time his play does still get a bit manic and he regresses back to what he knows. Not to pile on, but I think this falls on Tibbs. Obi's not playing in the moment, Obi's just playing. He's just waiting to get pulled, so he's trying to squeeze every single second out of his time on the court, which leads to him frantically running after people and taking above the break threes when he has room to drive. Now pretty much everything except for Obi's three point percentage has improved this season. But even still, he's only averaging 15 minutes a night and it's easy for a player to get in his, in his own head when he's not being rewarded for his improved play. This is why the lack of Obi Randall minutes was annoying when the rotation was at full strength and why at this point it's borderline malpractice. Finds Barrett. Get a shot up. This is for the win. Oh, it's good. Oh, RJ Barrett puts the finish. Again, to get back to that left hand. And that's where he's a nightmare to defend. Doris, Dallas is getting great look, just not hitting. As Barrett storms to the rim. Now, I spent most of our RJ video just raving about how great his mechanics were. And at the end of the game here, this was a fantastic sequence from RJ. He knocks down the three, then gets right back into a fantastic biomechanical position to lock down Levert. And he does so with perfect form. He has a low back squat, no extra back flexion. His knees and ankles are pointed in the same direction. Everything here looks crispy clean. The only thing missing back when he broke it down the first time was the consistency. Now, I pin that on how he jumps forward in his shot. Like I said then, it's just another thing, and it takes more time to settle in when there's more variables. No, 
Now, I have my own theory as to why this may be. Look here at RJ's landing after shooting. What I think is happening is that his forward momentum is forcing him to constantly have to be recalibrating his shot. His shot is carrying him forward. So a 23 footer, he's jumping a little bit forward in the shot, making it closer to a 22 and a half a footer. And those extra six inches are all the difference. And it's probably taking him a little bit of time to get in sync with that shot. He's still a second half player, but he's able to find that groove much sooner. Forget about a couple rough shooting lines just before spraining his ankle and both his field goal and three point percentages were improving month by month. And because fair is fair, sure, Tibbs may have gotten RJ hurt by playing him long into a loss he had no business playing in. I do think increasing his minutes from about 31 a night before we made our video to 35 since may be a part of what's helping him to get in that groove. Let him feel the game out a bit more. Timeline and the walking boot led me to believe that it was a grade two ankle sprain. So if he rolls it again, re-injury could end his season. But his mechanics are good, and good mechanics will lessen the likelihood of this happening again. It was a freak occurrence the first time. He stepped on a Nuggets player's foot on back-to-back -back steps. Typical Knicks luck, but not his fault at all. Here's Brockman. This is what he does. Oh, blocked by Robinson. Start the half. Third quarter of doom no longer, Allen Hunt. Get that weak stuff out of here. Both the man that was between the lines. Oh, he took a little shot from Powell. We dove into Mitch pretty much the same time that Tibbs booted him from the starting lineup. Now, Mitch was very public about spending the offseason bulking up. But as I saw, you saw, and Tibbs saw, it took away some of his explosiveness. And it kind of made him look like he was stuck in the mud out there. Again, Mitch had to reshape his body, this time in season. It is not easy. We were witnessing in real time Mitch trying to acclimate to a lighter frame. It's hard. When he entered the league, Mitch's calling cards were his agility, mobility, and ability to get to the perimeter to contest those shots. So he entered the 2021-2022 season after around eight months of downtime with 20 pounds of muscle. And even if it is muscle, 20 pounds is still 20 pounds. It's not like Mitch was known to play big minutes before, but this season he's made a point of trying to get his cardio back to at least an acceptable level. Now what's impressed me is just how quickly Mitch was able to adapt and find that energy equilibrium. I compared him to Piccolo, you know, when he would drop the shoulder weights and become twice as quick. It's going to take his body some time to get used to being lighter. He got used to being 280 pounds, which ironically is why he's getting tired so quickly. Remember in Dragon Ball Z when Piccolo would shed his shoulder weights and become twice as fast and do everything twice as awesome? It's kind of like that. I thought that would cause him to gas out, at least at first, but now I'm starting to think that Mitch might be a little Namekian. The work has shown up in the box score as well. He's second in offensive rebounding since that benching behind only Steven Adams. So if you know not counting guys to talk like this, he leads the league in offensive rebounding. As a trainer, it really makes me admire his worth ethic, but as a fan, it terrifies me about free agency. He is busting his ass almost as if he knows he is going to hit the market this offseason. And there's hopes that he'll sign an extension, but I don't know. Oh, it's been that kind of start for Brooklyn. Cam Reddish steps into a three. That's good. Unbelievable eruption from town. And rimmed it out. That pass, though. That's mental telepathy between the Splash brothers. And Reddish. Cam Reddish. Now, Cam's getting more minutes lately. He's definitely disruptive on defense. Those long limbs, like we talked about, are getting in the way of passing lanes and disrupting inbounds. He looks healthy. But I don't know if he is. These clips, one just before the ankle injury in Atlanta and the other one just before the All-Star break, look awfully similar. We were talking about how he's avoiding landing on his right foot at all costs. Now, he might get away with it this season, at least to an extent, but that same right ankle has already flared up a couple of times. And just like we said, it's all connected. So maybe this is some hush-hush load management situation, which is why I wasn't getting mad when Cam was getting DNPs. Maybe Tibbs does hate him. He hates young people. But maybe, just maybe it's for a good reason and it's the training staff just being cautious. 
Still, if it is reactive tendinopathy, like I think it is, anything Cam does on that right foot is going to hurt. And he might just be writing it off as that typical post-game soreness. And if that's the case, it is going to come back to bite him later on. So reactive tendinopathy is the phase that only acts up when you return to that stressful activity. It's the short-term exaggerated response to the overuse interrupting the healing process. Until his Achilles is 100%, he is prolonging his recovery and potentially putting himself at risk for major injury. We know Cam had a non-surgical procedure in the offseason, and if I had to guess, I would say that it was either a stem cell treatment or a PRP treatment, which would be a platelet-rich plasma. Now, both of those would just aid in the regeneration of those tendons and ligaments. Really, my prescription would be rest. In the offseason, shut Cam down. Walking boot if necessary, restrict mobility entirely. Yeah, you're sacrificing an offseason of work and chemistry building with the team, working out with your friend RJ, but that could be the potential difference between peaking as a role player or reaching that ceiling. Now, that ceiling could be all-star games, becoming the second or third option behind RJ or Randall, or maybe someone who's yet to arrive. Maybe the third Duke of York. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. No, I don't like ending things on a negative note, but it seems a little fitting based on how this season has gone. Now, we got 20 or so games left, and I'll be here breaking things down for better or for worse. For the Knicks wall, I'm Raymond Brentkert, and remember, when you move better, you feel better.